Hello, hello. There we go. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Timothy Von Rieden, better known as Von Art Online, and welcome, welcome to these weekly Wednesday live streams on YouTube. And I do these to hopefully inspire you guys, create fantastical illustrations, and today we're going to be doing something a little different. Uh, uh, today we're going to be golding some of the prints that I have for the upcoming convention this weekend. So if you have any comments or questions that you'd like to ask me while I'm doing this, it's kind of a free-for-all period because I... Uh, mostly don't have like an agenda of what to show or what to talk about. I'm just going to be golding and kind of hanging out with you guys. So let me go ahead and get this all set up here. And let me know if you can hear me all right. I know sometimes the microphone acts really weird. And today I don't have Josh. He is helping clean the rest of the house. We have quite a few people staying with us this weekend. We have as of right now, 16 different artists coming over. And they're coming over for Anime Milwaukee. And it's the first con of 2022 for a lot of us. So it's kind of a celebration in a way. And you know, I'm pretty excited to see everyone because it's been a hot second since I've seen some of these artists. So it'll be pretty exciting. Hey, Oscar, how are you doing? So yeah, I should mention I am using Deco Color Liquid Gold. These are the pens I use basically for uh, all my prints that I gold. And I really like the results. Yeah, let me turn on an overhead light so it might be easier to see. So you can see where the gold is. It kind of acts like this nice metallic mirror that I really enjoy. And uh, I've tried so many other gold pens and this seems to be the best in terms of results and like quality. But using it, I must admit, is terrible. They uh, often like spill out, or they jam, or they get thick. And it's really difficult to kind of lay the gold out. So I, it's weird for me to want to recommend these because I don't think the results are great. But I do enjoy uh, the quality of the finished result. But getting there is a little tricky. <laughs> Hi, everyone. How are you guys doing? Hope you guys are having a wonderful Wednesday. As I mentioned, I'm just going to be golding these prints. So if you have any even questions about uh, doing cons and uh, what that's like, or even any questions about the print process, because I do all the printing in-house, so we have uh, part of our basement kind of dedicated to a print slash uh, shipping area and that has something that took kind of years to develop and build up but now we got to the point where it's pretty smooth and doing prints we have like a backlog so I think we have at least 200 300 prints just on backlog and it's been really nice because then I'm not constantly having to um, do golding for prints or for cons when in reality I really just want to be drawing as I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, like, I want to be an independent artist, but I don't want to just constantly be doing the business side of things. And finding that balance can be difficult. Why, thank you, Diego Escobar, for following. And welcome, welcome. So that's been something that, I mean, I'm 32 now, and I will say my mid to late 20s, it was kind of a scramble. It was like figuring out how do I maintain running an online shop while still uh, doing conventions smoothly and then also making new drawings? And finding that balance was it's very difficult. Uh, difficult not in the sense of like strenuous, but more in a lot of trial and error. And eventually you kind of land on something that fits with your schedule, with your lifestyle. And it just takes a lot of you know experimenting and finding out where that balance for you is. And then for golding prints like this, I try not to over gold. I try to have gold kind of act as an accent, as you can see. So it's just a nice little splash of an accent color on a grayscale piece. And I think gold is perfect for grayscale because 
it's this nice little pop of um, color without it being overwhelming. And it's funny, a lot of my history working with gold originally was because people didn't see my pencil stuff as like finished illustrations at conventions. So I initially added the gold to kind of validate it as a finished product. But <laughs> over the years, I feel like I've kind of lost that stigma of my pieces not looking finished. But my love for gold has only grown and grown. So uh, even though I don't think the stigma of pencil stuff not being finished uh, as much as it used to be, uh, I still still like having that little gold touch. Hi, Tefalina from Canada. Yeah, it's uh, I don't know how cold it is in Canada, but it's definitely a pretty chilly here in Wisconsin. And it's kind of funny because we have a lot of our friends coming from out of town this weekend. Like I said, there's 16 of us total coming, and a lot of them I don't think are acclimated to like cold weather like this, and uh, it might be a little bit of a shock. Um, and with golding prints like this, it kind of took me a while to figure out where I want a lot of the accents. So whenever I finish a piece and I know I want it to be part of my print collection, I do a couple test prints where I try golding out different areas and then I try to figure out where I think it looks good, where it's too much, where it definitely doesn't work. And then eventually I land on something that I think uh, fits, you know, just right for the piece. So for this one, I used to even gold these behind the body swoopy angles and then this one right here. And it was just too much. It was overwhelming and it it started to look borderline crassy, like like um, it was taking away from what the piece was trying to say, which is supposed to be like this, you know, flowy, elegant, floral goddess. But it, it started to look a little like try hardy. <laughs> Uh, sometimes with doing things with gold, you got to find that balancing act of where it looks good versus where it, it looks a little too much, you know, because yeah, gold's great, but if you overuse it, it can start to look a little, I, I like to think it looks a little crass. Um, Oscar says, what's the story of the woman in this piece of art? So this one I did in 2020. This was one that I did in the summer when I was drawing outside. And I was in the gazebo and I started drawing uh, a lot of these floral shapes, but I, I really like drawing this type of a bust where it's like slightly turned and like shoulders, you know, kind of back and then the neck forward. So it started with this and then a bunch of these like floral designs and then it just built its way down. But for me, this really embodied just letting go. I had a lot of um, expectation that I put on myself because this was right after I did my first card deck. So I wanted to do a drawing that felt very freeing and very like of the time. And since I was in such a relaxed summer kind of vibe, that's the mood and kind of the emotion I wanted to get through with this one. So I would say it's less of a story and more of a feeling for this one. And this is one I was really trying to play more with um, like shapes that are just laid into the piece to try to accent it. And I was playing with a lot of these shapes here. And especially the one that she's holding. Originally, I think she was gonna be holding like a chair or something. And I even took a reference picture of me like holding the chair outside in the garden. And as I started to draw it, I, I liked this more like Mooka-esque orb. But I have to be a little careful because uh, I do get compared to Mooka, but I always feel like I don't want to be derivative of him. I have to be very careful <laughs> that like, I can be inspired without it just being a copycat. So I think that's why if I ever do things that kind of have that Art Deco Mooka feel, I might then do a few pieces that don't include it afterwards so that I don't just get lumped in as like an Art Deco artist. Uh, not that it's a bad thing necessarily. But I feel like there's more to what I want to create than just limiting myself to kind of this box of what Art Deco is. Uh, ja Janasha Color says, throw all the gold on the prints, it's beautiful. I will, I definitely will. I think I'll do one more flora and then I'll move on to the next. So I'm, I'm trying to do about three or four of each print. I think I have eight to do. So the stream's gonna be a little different because 
Uh, it's just a golding and chatting print. Uh, Teflina says, have lots of hot chocolate available. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, we're going to have uh, hot chocolate, uh, maybe a little bit of alcohol for the friends. And then what else? Do you, oh, and I love tea. A good tea in the morning. I've been really a big fan of Lady Earl Grey, which is funny because I'm not a big fan of Earl Grey, but I really like Lady Earl Grey. So yeah, we'll definitely get them bundled up while they're here. Uh, Josh Andrew Wisdom says, what's the most fun part of your illustrations? There is a section in between the initial sketch and like render detailing. There's this like in between section of the drawing and I really enjoy that phase. Like really, really, really enjoy that phase. I think because I can really get into a zone while working on it and I don't have to worry about the conception as much most of the foundation is laid out for me already. The thing I have to really focus on is just sharpening some of the edges or adding some value here, but not going too dark yet. It's still in like that middle phase where it could change if I needed it to. Uh, that stage I find really, really entrancing. But if it was in terms of subject matter, I usually really enjoy drawing hands, collarbones, like shoulder and collarbones, and then the eyes. I really like drawing eyes. And then hair, hair is interesting. There are times I really like drawing hair and then there are other times I just, it's just not flowing right and I have to keep erasing it and then doing it over again. And that can be really frustrating. But hair can be very enjoyable for me. So I guess those would be my favorite part of the illustrations. Uh, Natalia says, what inspires your art? Uh, I mean, it's, it's when it, it comes to like inspiration, I think every artist pulls from like every facet and aspect of their life. I think for me specifically though, I really do love film. If I wasn't in uh, the art world, I think I'd be a movie uh, reviewer or like a, a critiquer. I, I just, I love film so much. So I try to watch a new movie almost every day when we're not having like crazy convention schedule. And uh, video games, I think, uh, really inspired me when I was growing up, especially the likes of, you know, Tetsu Nomura and uh, Yoshitaka Amano with the Final Fantasy series. And then uh, there's just a lot of games here and there that you wouldn't think influenced me as heavily as they have. Like, I really, really enjoyed Twisted Metal uh, Black, and I love the designs of the vehicles and the stories and the overall package that the even game case came in on PS2. Like they really put a lot of time and effort into even like the inside manual and tried to make it look like one of the characters journals and it was deranged and had staples everywhere and it was handwritten notes throughout it. And you just don't see that level of care and craft put into like a game case anymore. And like things like that really inspire me when people go above and beyond when they didn't need to. Uh, that really inspires me. And it could be literally anything. So not even if it was just focused in the art world. Um, I could watch, like I'm, I'm watching the Olympics right now and watching these figure skaters or these snowboarders and how much passion you can just tell. Oh, see, here's a good example of the pen leaking. This happens all the time with this pen. It drives me nuts. Thankfully, that's why I have a little cheat sheet in case stuff like this happens. Uh, so literally just passion in almost any any field. Uh, there's so many documentaries on Netflix that I watch, not because I'm interested in the subject matter, but I'm just interested in seeing passionate people doing what they love. So that really inspires me. And then I would say lastly, fashion uh, very much inspires me. Maybe not so much modern fashion. I feel like it's gotten a little strange. Uh, not in a good way. I like weird fashion, but it's gotten kind of like bland uh not my favorite but i do like fashion a lot and then let's see lastly i think it would be like fantasy specifically like old fantasy like 80s fantasy i think there was this level of heightened elevation and everything being very fantastical and i think that element has been replaced by kind of the game of thrones era of fantasy which still it, it it's nice it has its touches but for me i like the overly decadent, you know, floating petals everywhere and, uh, you know, centaurs and satyrs and 
you know, I, I like that kind of fantasy where it's it's kind of almost ridiculous how fantastical it is. So yeah, I would say those are my biggest inspirations. And then other artists. I mean, I go on Instagram and Pinterest every day and I just see what people are doing, what uh, I think works, what I don't think is working. And I'm sure as I know a lot of the times I feel about myself, you can tell when an artist is just clocking in for the day versus when they're like really pushing something new and exciting. And uh, that's always fun to see. Uh, Elena says, this piece is my top three pieces of yours. I just love it. I assume you're talking about Floral Goddess because this one was so strange. When I finished it, it just felt so good. And I posted it and it became my most liked image ever. And it was like, it was kind of euphoric for me because it was during the you know early pandemic this is 2020 summer of 2020 and i just finished a card deck that uh, did better than i was expecting on kickstarter so i felt like i was able to relax through june and july a little bit because i didn't have to worry about money as much at the time and doing that drawing it just felt so good and organic all the way through i didn't have like a set agenda for it and i think sometimes that really shows in fished results so I don't know how many of you are artists watching this right now, but uh, I'm sure you felt that feeling where you worked on a drawing that didn't really have a purpose to begin with. And by the end of it, it ended up being like one of your best pieces you ever done. And that's not to say you should always, you know, judge a piece by how good it does based on, oh, do you see that drip? Oh my gosh. Well, that prints a dud. See, I gotta move on to a different marker. This is why I don't recommend these to people. I love the result, hate working with them. <laughs> but anyways, it's uh, like I was saying about you know pieces and how you dictate if they're good or not. I I felt so good about the floral goddess when I finished it that it didn't really matter to me how much it was going to be received. But you can usually have an inkling, you know, of if it's gonna do well or not and I knew that it was like a pretty female with like floating hair and pretty petals but I, w I was really feeling the drawing so I didn't really care if it did well or not but I, I kind of had an inclination that it would you know be received somewhat well I, I don't know I feel like it's a interesting composition but I, I try not to let that dictate how I feel about the drawing though so I always try to remind myself when I finish a drawing to like evaluate it on a personal level and how do I feel about this drawing before I release it to you know social media and have it be basically judged and critiqued on its social reach how many likes comments all that nonsense so I've been much better in my 30s about uh, making sure that I enjoy the piece first and foremost and not caring as much if it's received well or not and it can be challenging certainly but I feel like you have to do that as an artist or else you're constantly just going to be following uh, the reception of your pieces and only creating things that you think people want rather than creating the things that you want to create. And that's a fine line. It really is. And I know, especially when you're starting off in the art world, uh, me and my friends called it playing the game where you would make a piece or an illustration that you just you had a really good indication that it would do well. And I, I had one of those pieces, it was like five or six years ago, and I drew a fox. And I knew that it would probably do well because all, some of my other friends were drawing foxes and it was like one of their best prints at their booth. And then doing all these conventions, and at the time it was a lot of anime conventions, you know, Kitsune, uh, you know, fox stuff has been really popular there. So I drew a fox, playing the game, I ended up actually enjoying the process of the drawing of Fox, but it, admittedly, the intention going into it was I wanted to create a piece that would be well received. And since then, I haven't really done a piece like that because it doesn't feel the greatest when you feel like you're just playing the market. Uh, there are times where maybe it is authentic, but for me, I'm very aware of you know, where my mind is while I'm creating something. And I would say my best pieces have been from when I really just am drawing from like uh, 
my heart in like a good way. I know that sounds cheesy, but it's like you're drawing something that you wanted to draw and it was for you first and foremost. So yeah, don't, don't ever forget that. Uh, let's see here. Hey Felix, how are you doing? Elena says, yeah, I do mean floral goddess. I remember when you did it that you said it wasn't that purposeful and I think that's one reason it speaks to me so well as it feels so free. Yeah, it, I mean, I'm, I'm glad you felt that because that's definitely, you know, the emotion I felt while working on it. So I'm glad that it was kind of communicated that way. And it, it's funny how I noticed that my drawings feel more tight and more rigid when I'm going through something more stressful in my life. I tend not to be as like flowy. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's definitely something that I have to be more aware of. Uh, Oscar says, what do you think is the most important thing to practice slash focus on to elevate your art? I want to draw characters in beautiful or interesting scenes. So, okay. I think for me personally, life drawing by far was the most important thing for me on getting better with my work, specifically because I like drawing people and figures. So I think it's a good question to ask yourself of what do you want to focus your art on? And if it is people and characters, then yes, I do think life drawing would be absolutely the best thing you could do. Um, and not just do it a couple times, but like routinely do it. Uh, now that COVID is starting to loosen up a little bit here in Wisconsin, I noticed there's this life drawing place that opened up. So I'll probably start attending that. And I found out the last one that they had, they actually had aerial silk life drawing models. And I'm like, ah, oh, I wish I would have gone to that. That sounds amazing. Uh, but to answer your second question though, if you wanna have them being placed in interesting scenes, then that's also a different thing you gotta study. I think starting to look at Pinterest, specifically environment art that you find intriguing, and then really try to pick apart constructively, what do you like about it? And it could be the composition, it could be the color, it could be the design, it could be the subject matter, but really try to make mental notes of what do I like so much about this and how can I pull that as inspiration into my own work? And environments are tricky, you know? Uh, I, me being more of a character artist, doing environments always are a challenge and just remember if you're doing environment or literally if you're doing any uh, style of subject matter uh, focus remember that it'll take a lot of practice a lot of trial and error so don't try to spend 300 hours on one environment piece when you don't even feel confident yet on doing environments i would focus more on creating like 300 environment pieces, but take no more than two or three hours and um, try to learn from each one because then over time you'll get that quality you're looking for and you'll also get the quantity because you're, you've are you gotten so skillful with your knowledge of environments or characters or whatever it is that you can just start you know pumping out your ideas and not have to focus so much on uh, the fundamentals. Uh, Light Lollet says, isn't it better to use gold ink with a brush? Less, less accidental drips. You know, I have thought about that and I think I might switch over sometime because it has been a very frustrating ride with this pen. And I've thought of that. I'm like, I think I could do this with a brush like just as fast and not have to worry about uh, leakage and having to shake it or all that stuff. So yeah, that is a good idea. Thank you. Uh, let's see, Elena says, and the other two favorites are things you've really thought out. It works out that way. You know, sometimes it's funny. Uh, I think with my, my drawing style, a lot of people ask me like, what's my process? The way that I look at it is I have three different processes for doing my drawings and I never try to force one of them on any of my drawings. So the first way would be like if I'm doing thumbnails of a drawing and I have a concept in my head that I really wanna convey and then I'll transfer it um, bigger and I'll try to work it out that way. So that would be my first step uh, or my first way of drawing. My second one is I'll literally have a blank piece of paper and start drawing. Literally no intention, no direction, just see what happens. And then the third one, I guess would be more of like 
I have, well, it's weird. My third one would be more of like a structured one. So like a tarot card, or if I'm doing freelance work where there's a very specific uh, subject matter that I need to create. That one I'll, I'll do more rigid and more structured. And I feel like I normally do one or two, but I never try to force one of them onto a drawing. Like for my Drawtober drawings, almost always do thumbnails first, but if I'm working on a drawing and I'm really not liking the direction, I'll just start over and I'll try doing it organically. I, I really do believe in trusting your intuition as an artist and that gut feeling can be so powerful to push you in the direction that uh, is the right one for you and your finished result. Um, Ash says, as an artist with a small following on social media, do you recommend artist conventions? If so, any tips for your first convention? I absolutely recommend conventions, especially if you have a small following. I started doing conventions eight or nine years ago now, and I didn't really have much of a following at all. And I did conventions more because I saw it as a way to make money and potentially leave my full-time job. Uh, even though I liked my job at the time, uh, I knew that this was something I could either make side money from or yeah, eventually leave my full-time job and just do this full-time. Uh, I, I really like grassroots marketing. So that's when you're like literally meeting people face to face. And I know it's been hard with COVID and uh, I feel bad for younger artists that are just trying to, you know, get their foot in the door because it has been so difficult for in-person events to even happen. But now that COVID's starting to kind of exit its way, well, depending on where you are and how you feel about it, uh, I know for myself and Josh, we're, we're going to conventions again. And just being able to have conversations with people that enjoy your art and give them a business card or, you know, have your little Instagram sign out on your booth, it's like the easiest way to gain followers quickly uh, in, in a way that's not just like throwing money at a <laughs> platform. Because you could definitely pay for followers nowadays. And I think with Instagram and TikTok and heck, you can even do it with YouTube and um even Etsy now, you can pay for Etsy ads. There's a lot of like pay to win schemes and they they typically work pretty well, but um, to really like hold or to transfer someone from being just like a fan or like a follower of your work to someone that's like a, as we call them like true fans, uh, you need to have that personal connection and that engagement with the person. And it doesn't mean you have to be in person. Like you could get a lot of this, even doing things like this, like YouTube live and uh, Instagram live. But I do think going to cons is a great way to get yourself out there. And it, it really helps you see what people are interested in with your work. Like for me, I was so scared to do an all pencil booth and I had a lot of color. I had a lot of fan art at the time. And I started to slowly introduce some of my pencil stuff and I could tell there was some interest in it. And there was enough that um, after I met Alan Williams, who's like my art hero, his whole booth was pencil. And I, it just blew my mind. I was like, okay, if he can do this, I can do this. And it was just the right push I needed to try to do it. And I went to a con and yeah, people, I, I made like double what I normally do at conventions with an all pencil booth. and. I don't think I would have got that surge of confidence or that reassurance that yes, this is definitely the path you should be on. You should continue with this uh, if I didn't have conventions. So I'm very, very, very thankful for conventions. And there's been a lot of like drama in the convention world, especially behind the scenes with artists uh, the past couple of years. And because of that, I think a lot of older artists are not doing cons as much. And it kind of created this pocket uh, that it was like this empty pocket for artists that are kind of my age that it's time for us to kind of like step up and kind of be the new, it's weird saying this, but like the new older artists at conventions. And I really want to be a mentor to younger artists at conventions and help them and uh, be one of the, you know, artists that aren't <laughs> seen as scummy or there's just a lot of things that, uh, transpired in the past few years that it really disappointed me with the art community because I really like the art community and uh, I just feel like we're all these weirdos that grew up 
not necessarily fitting in perfectly and it's like we found each other as adults and we're able to make money doing what we love and it was like this beautiful thing but uh now i feel like i i want to now step up and like bring back that resurgence of like good artists who happen to also be great people and i i hope i can fill that role because a lot of the people I look up to, like Annie Stagg and Justin Gerard and Alan Williams and Brahm, and uh, a lot of these artists are just so, um, so generous in their advice. But you can just tell they're they're genuinely trying to help people, and they're just good natured, and that's something that I, I've always strived for myself, um, getting into the art world. And, you know, back in my early mid-20s, I was always thinking, you know, I wanted to be, like, one of the bigger named artists. And now that I'm older, I recognize that's not as important as being an artist that has a good impact on people. And that's kind of my new goal for my 30s is to be that artist that uh, inspires younger ones. And a lot of this, going back to your question, a lot of this does go back to just being at cons, finding that community of like-minded artists, and building up connections over time. So absolutely, I would say do your kind. I know that was a long-winded answer for the question, but uh, absolutely. And start local. And understand that your local cons probably won't be great, but they're a great start. All right, sorry, that, I took so long on that. I have to scroll up. Uh, Felix says, I really want to do life drawing again. I started just before COVID and loved it, and then everything shut down. Oh, I feel the same way, same way. Uh, Elena says, I agree on life drawing. I haven't been in a couple years, but when I went frequently for a full summer, it changed so much about my art and the art process for the better. Oh, 100%. Uh, I remember <laughs> I went to college and I felt like I was, you know, pretty good at drawing people. Hindsight, I wasn't. But at the time, I felt like I was. And life drawing, like, shut down a lot of <laughs> my perspectives of how well I thought I could draw people. And holy crap, was I so bad at uh, muscle anatomy specifically and like placing like the collarbone stuff. I, I thought I knew how to draw a neck properly and then I did life drawing. I was like, oh, <laughs> it was so bad. It was so off. And uh, I, I miss it. I, I want to do life drawing again. And so hopefully in the coming weeks, I'll be able to go again. Uh, let's see here. Oh, Lane. Hey, Lane. Lane is one of our Waukesha well, Wisconsin, I guess, artist, I should say. Uh, and I, I love Lane. Hi, I'm on my break and I saw you live and I just want to say I miss you so much. Remember that you are the raddest. Well, thank you, Lane. Uh, Lane actually hosted Life Drawing back in the day. I, I miss doing them uh, just here in Waukesha because now I have to drive to Milwaukee, which is fine. It's worth it. But it was nice having a, a local one. So who knows? Maybe, maybe bring it back, Lane? Maybe? <laughs> Uh, Light Lawlet says, would love to part of some sort art class in general. I think you mean like you would like to be part of an art class? Yeah, to be honest, my college experience was not great. I think it was overpriced and I didn't learn as much as I did from the teachers as I did my peers. And we were all so hungry uh, in college that we would just learn new techniques in Photoshop and we would constantly be sharing with each other. And especially if we learned how to shade something or like once we learned how to bounce light behind an object or what occlusion shadows were, it's like we were always trying to one up each other, but in like a healthy competition way. And I miss that energy sometimes. And I think I do best when I'm uh, like competing, but in a way that isn't trying to win, if that makes sense. Uh, and I think my all my college friends had that and it was really 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 helpful for me to grow really fast so I would say if you can get into an art class you you can but just try not to waste your money going to an art school because they're so overpriced nowadays that they really are not worth the penny in my opinion when you can learn so much on YouTube for free or even patreon from artists that you enjoy but the one thing I will say that going to an art school gave me was the community and the people that we're not only like-minded. I mean, I came from a high school where no one even knew what a Hayao Miyazaki movie really was. I had like maybe two friends that saw Spirited Away. <laughs> uh, and then I go to 
college and or this art school and I realize I'm the one that actually lacks knowledge in like the weird and unusual forms of media and it was this crazy fun uh, realization that there's a lot of weirdos like myself out there that love drawing love art uh, that can share so much with me and I was just all ears I wanted to I wanted to learn and absorb all of it so that was the best part in my mind about art school Ooh, okay we're moving on to blind confidence I believe I have yes I needed my little cheat sheet on where I golded this one because I have so many prints sometimes to keep it consistent I have to remind myself of where I golded it oh let's see here sorry where's the next question do, do, do. Uh, Elena says, I'm not sure if it makes sense, but life drawing and the time restrictions there helped me a lot with not hesitating making big decisions with art pieces. I feel like I'm spamming you, but also I remember the fox well. It's the only pin of yours I have. Uh, no, you spam away. That's why I'm here, you know? I wouldn't be doing live streams if we weren't having this, you know, good chat. So, uh, yeah, the time restrictions was huge too because I think I noodle too much. If you know what that means, it's basically like, you're working on a drawing, but you're not really making progress. Like, yes, you're putting pencil to paper, but you're not really making progress. And I would say I definitely have an issue with that from time to time, as I'm sure many of you do as well. So having that time restriction, I mean, you are like laser focused for most of it, or at least I was. And I was really able to get faster and efficient with working. And that was another thing that Life Drawing gave me. So yes, I 100% agree with you. Anu Beginning says, hi, great to finally catch a stream. Well, hello, hello. Any suggestions on when you feel an artist is ready to start doing commissions? Uh, yesterday. Yes, the, the, the few days before yesterday. Start as soon as you can. Uh, I started doing commissions during the end of my college year. I was 21. It was a three-year school. So I was 21 and I started doing commissions. And I was just taking kind of anything at the time, kind of a... Uh, a beggar uh, to be honest I was just like I, I need to make money doing art I, I want to do this as a living and I am not going to share the commissions I did because they are god-awful and some of the subject matter was questionable but I, I needed to try it out and what that gave me is a sense of uh, learning what I like what I don't like and there was one piece I actually did enjoy um, working on it was a World of Warcraft night elf and at the time it ended up being I think the best thing I painted and I think at the time I did it for like 70 bucks. I mean, I, it was severely undercharged, like criminally undercharged for, um, yeah. I was doing a disservice to every artist in the industry. Um, but because of that, I started to gain a sense of worth and I was able to then start upping my prices. So I would say literally as soon as you can, just start doing it because it, it gives you a lot of knowledge and uh, confidence uh, moving forward and especially if you want to work with bigger clients down the line it's good to know uh, your sense of worth and not to underprice yourself um, Oscar says when you say life drawing life drawings is it about drawing from real life references or drawing live uh, what is the main benefit with it uh, basically it's oh I, I see someone's already answering it underneath but yeah having well for me life drawing is specifically human models uh, usually naked and they're like doing poses for 15 30 minutes hour poses and you are just drawing from life uh, I'm, I'm sure there's better YouTube videos out there that can explain uh, the importance of having a life or a live model rather than just drawing from a photograph uh, in my experience I think actually seeing the nuances and like seeing the form slightly shift when they breathe and just to see the shadows in person and have that perspective on it where you can kind of move your head a little bit to like see if you like are missing something. And then also I think it creates the sense of life and um, this is gonna sound so, so cheesy, but your figures feel more alive because you see the breathing, uh, you know, beating heart flesh human in front of you and I think you capture it more because you're capturing more of them. Uh, I think when you're doing it from a photograph, it can be sometimes kind of cold. And I think it's because there is no connection between you and that person. But I think having that intimate 
you know, moment. And I'm not saying like intimate in that way. You know what I mean? Intimate as in you are sharing this very uh, unique experience with another person, allowing themselves to be vulnerable and naked in front of you for basically for your benefit. You know, them being there is benefiting your art skill to get um, better. And there's always a respect I have for the life drawing model because of that, because I, I understand that they are there for you to uh, strengthen your own skills. So because of that, I think I put a little more effort into truly, truly trying to capture them um, in their essence. So yeah. Hi, Carlos. Good morning, good morning. Corinna MP says, is it hard to make simpler art look cohesive with the rest of my art? Detailed art takes ages, so I end up with opulent and comic-y art. Any ideas to fix this? I like your your dirt kids fit in. Oh, okay. So doing portfolios that contain very elaborate work and then very simple work. It can be a tough thing to do in the modern age of social media because social media just wants to see consistency and for it to be kind of the same, 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 same over and over again. And for me, I, like many artists, you know, I don't want to just produce the same type of work over and over. Uh, there are times where I'll create work that is very similar. Like even looking at the few that I have here, there are a lot of similar elements with like blocked out faces and um, these female quarter turn. And yeah, for me, those are fun to draw. But like what you said, I sometimes like drawing these little dirt kid you know, characters and they're very simple. And uh, I think that's totally okay. I think it shows that you have a range and that you just have a wider range of experience with uh, interests. Um, for myself, I know it can get very difficult when I want to start a larger piece because I know it won't perform well on social media uh, in the way that I, I could just draw like a simple female bust with like pretty hair. And I know that that will do very well on social media. And I'm sure a lot of you guys are aware of this too. I mean, there's artists out there that all they do are female busts and portraits and they have some of the most followers on Instagram and their art's really not that um, anything crazy. Uh, and there's, there are times where I, I talk to my friends about this, where some of these artists, I don't feel like are artists per se as they are producers. They're just like a factory assembly line that, kind of whips out the same thing over and over because that's what social media is calling for. And it doesn't feel like there's a lot of life or personality behind what they're doing. But I do respect the hustle. So who am I to, you know, knock them down when, I mean, if they love doing it, you know, that's that's their way of creating. And I, I me talking bad about them is only out of bitterness or jealousy, I'm sure. And you kind of realize that the older you get, because in my early 20s, it was very easy for me to like look at all these popular artists and be like, oh, well, that's because people have no real sense of what art is and it should be more than just a pretty girl. And uh, that was something I had to learn over the years and like swallow the humble pill. <laughs> um, but if you want to draw simple and you want to draw elaborate, then do it, you know, don't try try your best not to let social media dictate what you do and don't create and I know that that's been something I think about all the time and I have this five foot drawing upstairs where it's my underwater epic and I'm drawing everything super small and I know it'll take years and years and years to finish and it's really hard to want to just sit down and work on it because I know it's very hard to promote it on social media and I hate that it sometimes has this grip on me and what I create and I'm always like battling that. And anytime I get the thought of, um, I should just draw something simpler because I need to post something this week, I have to like mentally slap myself and be like, no, that's not how an artist should work. They shouldn't just work to please an algorithm. Uh, so I feel you on that, definitely. Well, I, I would say because of the algorithm with specifically Instagram moving towards video content, it has been a little easier for me to navigate like doing close-up shots and like while working on it and not showing a finished piece but kind of showing the steps along the way so maybe if that helps you with doing these bigger pieces that you're talking about try to kind of capture the process of creating it over time because people enjoy seeing the journey and i've been watching a lot of 
social media uh, stuff on YouTube and like how to uh, do better on you know Instagram in 2022 and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of the engagement talks about um, showing the journey and being okay with the fact that you're showing the process and it's not going to be perfect. Uh, people like seeing that. People like seeing, you know, the journey. I would love to see even more from artists that I really enjoy. So I get it. I think that's true. But definitely don't stop doing large pieces. Uh, let's see here. Where was I? Uh, Ningyo says, hi, I watched your, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, but I watched your previous live on oh on instagram two days ago there were so many times i wanted to live comment oh well i'm glad you're commenting here i i feel like i'm one of the easiest people to uh interact with because nothing really offends me and uh, i can literally talk about anything so uh, even if like you hate a movie like vividly hate a movie that i really like or like a, a drawing i've done uh, i'm totally okay with you telling me you know i I think it's good to like lean into constructive criticism or if someone wants to debate you on like why they hate something that you love, mm -hmm. it kind of makes you reevaluate why you love it and if you still have that stance or not. And one of my friends, Victor, he, he works at Riot. He was one of the lead artists on Arcane and he wrote this quote on my whiteboard the last time he was here and it was, thank you for being you so that I can be me. And it's this whole idea of like contrast creates a lot of your personality and your likes and interests and um anyways i'm kind of tangenting but i really enjoy that aspect because then nothing really bothers me anymore because if someone hates something i love if i can defend it with clarity and i feel like i i do believe in that and it's not malicious in intent um then that really means i i really enjoy that and it's like an authentic honest thing anyways <laughs> Um, Oscar says, so how does one then combine different methods like lumens, etc., with life drawings? Would you still use a method or draw from what you see? I don't know. I don't actually know what lumens is. Um, should you still use a method or draw from what you see? I, when I do life drawing, I try to make it as visually accurate as possible. So I go down the hyper realism um, side of things. And I think it's because I, I can learn a lot by trying techniques that are different than how I would normally approach subject matter. And then I can use what I like and pull it back into my own style and my own way of rendering. That doesn't mean all my drawings will start to look more hyper real because I'm not, I'm not a hyper realistic artist uh, by interest. I, I prefer more of like graphic, you know, fun, fantastical, floaty things. Uh, and I like the lighting to be kind of ambiguous ambiguous I cannot say that word ambiguous that doesn't sound right but vague we'll say vague uh, but when I'm in life drawing I try to capture it to the best of my ability and there have been times where I learned like I like shading a little different than I thought I did uh, so I would say try doing it realistic and pick up what you can doesn't mean that everything you have to do is like hyper realistic uh, from that point forward uh, Ningyo says, like about people asking repetitive questions, like have you seen Kim Jong Ji has been questioned about what brushes he uses for like a decade. To be honest, I'm totally okay with that. I've been streaming for like 10 years basically. And I'll be on and off. Like sometimes I'll be more serious in the year and I'll be doing it every week where it's like a tutorial base and it's very much structured. And then as I got older, I would say they're more loose like this. And you know, I'm totally totally understanding that I'm gonna get a lot of repeat questions every stream and I don't mind at all so if you have any questions even if you think that I've already answered them a million times I don't care because like I said earlier I want to be one of those artists that give back to the next generation because I had so many artists that did that for me when I was younger that I now aspire to be like that and give back in any way that I can so yeah go for it shoot any question you want uh, let's see here. <laughs> oh, I see light. Yeah. Elena says, the college prices in the U.S. kind of broke my heart, having paid no tuition fees ever through my 5.5 years at uni. Yeah, I think my art school at the end was 100 grand. Uh, it was crazy. 
thankfully um i kind of was having a privileged situation where my parents were able to help pay with this and i know a lot of ours do not have that you know they they don't come from families that can do that but i ironically though my my parents i guess most kids would have considered i was poor growing up but it was like my dad's only dream was to see his three kids uh go to like good schools so it was weird because like we didn't take family vacations ever uh i think we went to disney once uh that was it though and i i now look back and i realize it was because my dad was trying to save money for our education so (laughs) i feel bad because i think i could have learned just as much from youtube (laughs) to be honest um and I, I think unless if you go to a school that is really good with hiring teachers that are good teachers, it just really isn't worth it in today's day and age to go to a, a college. And even five years ago, or no, what was it? This was like eight years ago. I was looking to get a job possibly at Pixar. And uh, at the time, I mean, there's a lot to it, but I actually got the job, but I, I turned it down because the only available... Um, opening was in Canada and I didn't want to move out of the States at the time but what was curious about me applying there was they didn't ask for my um, diploma or any type of paper saying I graduated from like an art school they just asked for my uh, portfolio so food for thought Uh, you definitely don't need it in today's day and age Let's see, I think I'm gonna do one more of these and then I'll move on to the next print here. I'm gonna move, I'm gonna move this over just a little bit. Uh, oh, hello from Denmark, Jens. Um, Ash says, when is your next update video on Aquatica Nautica? I'm really interested to see your progress. Yours is amazing. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it should be It should be next week. It, uh, it might be next weekend because uh, I, like I'm even printing or I'm golding these prints because we have a convention this upcoming weekend and we have 15 people staying at the house. So I decided not to do my normal dailies this week and focus on getting the house ready and getting everything with the con kind of prepped. So I'm not working on my my three projects, uh, including Aquatica and Nautica. So I think I'm at the 56 hour mark so i have four more hours to put into it and then i'll make the video because i try to do it every 20 hours and if you're my patreon backer you get to see the video right away so i'm pretty excited about it because uh, i've been really enjoying working on it this past month it's been one of those projects that i've been putting off kind of like what i was mentioning earlier because it's such a bigger piece it's really hard to want to work on a drawing that won't get like a reception from Instagram and we're so conditioned nowadays to want like fast responses and um, our attention spans are just getting shorter and shorter that to work on a piece that's five feet by four feet and knowing that it will take years to finish yeah it's not the most encouraging (laughs) Um, but because of my Patreon backers I feel like it gave me more of a purpose to want to work on it because then it's like a journey I'm able to take uh, with them. And uh, it's been kind of a fun sharing the back and forth and then them giving me ideas and then me trying to implement them. And uh, that's been really fun uh, connecting with people on, on that way again. So yeah, look forward in probably two weeks, full in two weeks for sure. Well, let's see here. Teflina says, I felt the same way about when I went to college, I thought I knew about different artists. Wow, was I wrong? Yeah, right. No kidding. Um, Jen says full body commission painted. Yeah, that was. I did a full body. Yeah, World of Warcraft Night Elf for seventy dollars, and uh, you could say I underpriced myself. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it was. It was pretty heavily detailed. I. I just was so desperate to get into the commission game. I was willing to undersell myself, which. Um, I don't recommend to artists. You know. Let's see here. Felix says, only drawing from photos gives you too much time to fiddle and think. Also true. uh, When you're drawing from like a Pinterest photo of a model, uh, you have all the time in the world. So it's really easy to not, you know, be efficient with your time. But with life drawing, you're limited, obviously. So uh, 
you, you move quicker. All right, let's move on to the next one here. Oh, this one's an easy one. My Yoshitaka Amano tribute in my Draltober series. Uh, what was this? This two years ago? I think this was two years ago. I just fill in some of the gold little speckles he has around him. Oh. Speaking of the artist staying here, Sean Price is calling me. Art of Price on Instagram. I'll be sure to call him back after. But um, where was I with the question? Adore says, love the book. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I have four sketchbooks. Uh, it's been kind of wild, the fact that I, I have four. It's weird to even say that out loud. But that has always been my dream, to have an art book. So the fact that I have four of them. And then in two years, I'm going to create like a mega book. I keep calling it my mega book. But I want it to be the 10 years of all five of my books combined. So it'll be like a thick coffee table book. <laughs> uh, I'm very excited about that one. Let's see here. Oh, of course, Corinna. Jen says, besides Final Fantasy X, what other PS2 Square Enix titles you played when you were younger that you would like to play now? You, it's so funny that you're asking that because uh, my best friend Kat comes over every Sunday and uh, I just finished Final Fantasy X with her there and we decided uh, between me, her, and Josh that uh, we're going to beat all the Final Fantasies. So we're going to start playing... Uh, we just started playing 7, but then we're going to play 8, 9, and then go backwards, and then 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Or who knows? Maybe once they actually come out on Switch, we'll start with 1 after we beat 7. Um, but these aren't PS2 ones, but uh, 10 and 12 were. I love the look of 12. Um, so I would say definitely I would want to replay Final Fantasy 12, but Square Enix after 12 really wasn't my favorite company in terms of what they created. I, I think they kind of dropped the ball for me in a lot of ways. Um, let me think. I mean, I guess there was that Star Ocean game that I played, and I'm pretty sure that's Square Enix, but I don't think it was anything that I would like want to replay. Like it was, it was fine for when I was younger, but I don't think I would enjoy it as much now that I'm an adult. Who knows? Could be wrong on that. I don't think I'm gonna do the nose thing. I thought I liked it. I don't think I like that. I mean, there's so many other games I remember so vividly from Final Fantasy or from PS2: uh, Shadow of the Colossus, Twist Metal Black, SSX3, Final Fantasy X, Kingdom Hearts. I think those type of games I would love to see, um, especially like SSX3. I think now that it's snowing outside and um, I'm teaching Josh how to snowboard, uh, I I forgot how much I I loved um, what SSX3 did with like the customization and uh, it was just great. So I'd love to see a remake of that. Um, <laughs> I have no idea what you're trying to say, Negan. Vium today? I have no idea what that means. Uh, Light says, like I have unfinished stuff from October and started new sketches this month and nothing is ever finished. Oh, okay. Uh, that is definitely a problem. I think you gotta take drawings to completion or else you'll have a bunch of drawings. And I, I get in this phase too. I mean, technically I'm kind of in it right now. I have a few drawings that are like at this level of complete. Let me make sure you guys can see this. Yeah, like we're getting there, but clearly there's still like at least eight hours of work that I want to do on this, but I'm just putting it on the back burner. And the problem is I have like four or five of those. So I kind of understand what you're going through and I get into these phases as well. The problem is, you want to take things to completion if you're feeling it because if you condition yourself to always just work on the next one regardless of if you finished your previous one you'll all you'll just be the artist that never can finish things and you don't want that to be the stigma with you and your work so i would recommend kind of digging your heels in and really picking a piece and deciding okay i'm gonna finish this one and I'm not going to work on any other piece until this one's done. And just see if you can even do it. I think sometimes we need to challenge ourselves because I think sometimes as artists, we we try to just like go with the flow and 
Um, I, I do believe in trusting your intuition, but I don't believe in uh, constantly just bouncing between projects and uh, that way you'll, you'll, you'll condition yourself to never finish things. And I think you have to break that habit. Uh, I consider it more of like a bad habit that you have to break. So that would be my advice for you. Uh, Oscar says, is there a method you would recommend for drawing people to draw without references that I can look up on YouTube? Uh, I personally would not recommend that. <laughs> I think if you're learning to draw people, uh, you need reference. I think if like, like when I draw figures now, like technically, I'm not really using a reference for this drawing that much, but I did use a reference just for the face, you know, just a quick picture of yourself and you can easily get that reference. But if you're learning to draw characters, I think having reference will build your understanding of anatomy and um, positioning. So I, I personally wouldn't try getting better at drawing figures without reference, um, but that, that could just be me. Age of the Atom says, I've been working on video games for like 13 years and I've only had one company ask for my transcripts. You really don't need a diploma. You really don't. Uh, I'm glad that you, you said that as well because it's become so true. And it was weirder for me when I went to college because this is like 14 years ago I went to college uh, where it was such a presumed thing that you needed you know, a diploma to get a good job. Um, man times have changed since then uh, very very quickly too I feel like it wasn't that long ago you know uh, slow burn says so happy to be a backer so you're able to do that oh well thank you thank you thank you for being a background patreon I really do appreciate it and it's been actually fun because I've been posting on the D patreon discord I'm especially on work days I'm posting basically every day uh, this week's a little weirder because I even mentioned in the discord because we have people over uh, I won't be working my dailies, but I feel like it's given me this burst of inspiration working with um, showing my Patreon backers what I'm doing, and it's been really fun. So thank you for being a backer. Felix says, I just started my job, and they didn't care about my degree at all either, but I did meet the person who got me the job at college. Technically, same for me too. Uh, my first job was teaching how to paint in Photoshop, surprisingly, and I guess I could do some of these and I met him at our school's job fair when I graduated so technically my school did put me in front of the people that uh, I was able to work for uh, but besides that nothing oh you know what I can't even do this one because I don't have my gold my big gold pens up here so I'm gonna skip this one for now all right, we can move on to the tarot cards here. So I have four of them I'm going to bring to the convention this weekend. I don't often sell my tarot prints. It's more of like a specialty. But I guess I can show you golding some of them today. So my Queen of Cups is a, a very simple golding. It's basically on the cup. Do you see some of the gold there? For some of my... Uh, prints when I gold them, it, I try to really read the drawing and uh, how much gold I think it should have and if there's like a good placement for it. So for her, it just, it would feel weird if I filled in these blanks with gold or these empty negative spaces. Or like if I filled in her earring, it just, what purpose does that really signify? And since she's the Queen of Cups, it just makes more sense to gold the, the cup itself and um, give it some more stylization there. So let me do a few of these. And I, I'm, what do I have? Like 45 minutes left? Okay. We're gonna get as many as we can done. Aningo says, is it easier to try convincing everyone to pay for your art or to have one boss? Having in mind they are mostly difficult to deal with. Uh, oh boy. Um. I would say it's easier to convince people to pay for your art. I I definitely am one of those believers in, uh, what's the quote? It's something like, be so good at something that people have to pay you to do it. And it could be literally in anything. It doesn't even just relate to art. 
Um, I think I, I heard that quote from a skateboarding documentary. <laughs> and uh, he mentioned, he was like, you know, when growing up, my parents didn't believe that I could do skateboarding full time. But uh, he had the same quote told to him of be so good at it that, you know, people will have to pay you for it. And that's how I feel about art as well. So one of my goals growing up was to be so good at art um, without being arrogant, because I think that's a fine line as well. I think you have to also be able to like constructively look at your things and critique where it could be better. Uh, but I think once you get that kind of confidence, it can then propel you to start creating with the intent of doing this full time and being your own boss. It's not for everyone though. As much as I would like to say, oh, everyone should try doing this. Uh, I have learned over the years that there are some people that prefer having kind of a guideline uh, told to them of what they should do. And sometimes they're better on teams. You know, I don't think I'm the best team player to be uh, honest with myself even. Uh, I mean, the, the sport that I was best at in high school was tennis and it was singles. I very much like being in control of uh, you know the game and for me with the art world it's kind of the same thing and I was mentioning earlier about college I like being competitive not because I necessarily want to win but because I love the energy that it gives me when I feel like I'm competing and I, I try to bring that energy into doing art so I would say it's easier to convince people to pay for your art <laughs> as long as you just create art that you deem um, of quality or to the best of your ability I should say Jen says is it tough cuz if you lower the prices too much you get cheap creeps who insist that the lower you do it or the low that you lower it or do it for free cuz they think you are easy picking yeah I definitely had a sum of that when I was in my early 20s I think I had people take advantage of my prices and there was one I it was like a $50 commission and they were so picky back and forth and I told them I was only going to give them two times to like give me feedback so when I sent the final over he was giving more feedback of what he would like change and I was like no I'm not no <laughs> I've already spent like 12 hours on this and at the time it was definitely below minimum wage and I think you also have to price things based on your time if you know you can do a commission in an hour then yeah $50 is pretty good that would be fifty dollars an hour but for me at the time it took me like 11 hours so not the best return um, especially when I'm like waiting for feedback and how to change things and it's it's really frustrating so yeah you gotta be careful with that starting out uh, Lenny's ask are I was going to give up on art till I found your channel your kindness slash generosity teaching me how to draw brought me back or brought back the joy for me I got better and now it's my full-time income. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh. That's great to hear that it's your full-time income now. Um, honestly, that's one of the, the best things I could have read today. Uh, I think I've been, uh, actually I've been better in 2022, but 2021 near the end, it was really rough for me. It was just like a weird stage of my art career and it wasn't great. So getting back into doing like YouTube and doing more of these Instagram lives and connecting with that mission that I really set out for myself in my mid twenties to like be an artist that can inspire the next generation and be like a mentor in some ways. Uh, it's, it's very validating to hear something like that. So thank you so much. And I'm, I'm, I'm so beyond thrilled that it's your full-time income. That's amazing. And you should feel very proud of yourself. Uh, Nyong'o says, oh gosh, look at that piece. I, I think you're talking about this one? Uh, yeah, this is the Queen of Cups. This is the uh, eighth tarot card I did. So we're getting there. You know, we're making progress. Uh, where was I? Yeah. Felix says, Tim's MAGA book. Uh, we love to see it. I am so excited for that book. I think mainly because uh, as much as it has been the dream of like having an art book, having like a mega art book is like double the dream. <laughs> so I'm planning on releasing that in 2023, I believe. Oh my gosh, it's coming up soon. That's crazy. That means I've been making art books for 10 years. 
and I think this is another piece of advice that um, I wish I would have told my younger self. Well, maybe not that I would have told my younger self, but in hindsight, I'm glad I told myself. Um, always play for the long game. And not even specifically in art, but like in everything. Um, try not to look for like instant reactions or um, instant feedback or results. I remember it was, I guess, eight years ago now, I started making art books and my initial plan was every two years I'd make an art book and then in 10 years I would combine all of them into one mega book. And I've been following that plan uh, since then. And it was one of those ideas I had that I'm really glad I, I set out to do because it kind of set this long game um, journey for me. And it kind of set a lot of pieces in place for more financial security along the, uh, the basically a long time because uh, the m more people that would get, you know, heed of my work, uh, they would know about these art books and then hopefully it would intrigue them to want uh, more of the art books and then eventually the mega book. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is try to create projects for yourself or ideas for yourself that will have a long term you know payout and I think yeah it's really nice to have like big flash sales of money whether it's like getting really viral on TikTok and making money there or making money on Instagram reels right now but I think for like long-term success you got to have these projects that are, are bigger that truly you are passionate about and uh, after this tarot deck like tarot decks another one of those actually another perfect example I'm now doing a tarot deck I'm not going to see a lot of instant reaction results from this like I won't be making a lot of money um, from them because for me I just want to make a tarot deck for myself first and foremost but I know the business side of my mind knows that in five years when I'm finished that this will be something I could sell at cons at bookstores uh, online and I, I think it will do well so find projects that you genuinely feel you're passionate about and you can then use the business side of your brain to then see like, is there a, a way I could sell this or market it that is profitable for me? There we go. Let's see here. Um, Jen says, oh, are you gonna play the Pixel Remasters? Yep, those are the ones I'm waiting for. Uh, they're, they're already on Steam, but I'm waiting for them to come out on uh, the Switch. Like I could play them on Steam, but when Cat comes over every Sunday, we always play in our front room. So we decided we're just gonna wait until it's on Switch. <laughs> um, Age says, don't skip tactics. I've actually never played tactics, but everyone always tells me it's so good. I like the art from it a lot, but you know, I, I think I will include tactics on that list. So yeah, I'll let you guys know once we finish it. Uh, like I said, we're starting with seven, the original seven and uh, I've never played this one all the way through. I got like near the, a third. It was after the big, I don't spoiler moment, but it was after that moment. It was a little after that is how far I got in the original seven. So I actually have no idea what actually happened. So please don't spoil it for me in the, the comments. I'm very excited about that. All right, we got one more queen and then, oh no, this one's done. Ah, moving on to the hanged man. Move up a little bit so you can see what I'm golding here. So the hanged man's interesting. I only wanted to gold some of the coins that are falling out of his pocket, as you see there. And then the rope that's holding his foot, uh, indicating, you know, hanging yourself from a different perspective so you can see something from a different perspective. And then the 12, which is the major. So I, I feel like that had some significance. Um, Jen says, the reason I'm asking is because I am feeling nostalgic about Valkyrie Profile. That's another one I haven't played yet. But that one I also do like the art for. Um, Oscar says, when when do you consider your own work done or at a minimum finished, and when does something become over-rendered? Ooh, this is a great question because uh, I did a piece recently where I knew I was... Oh, actually... This one. So I'm working on my Aquatica card deck 
And it's been funny working on him where I over-rendered the body and I, I can feel it. I, I need to like rework it a little bit. And it was funny because while I was working on this, I actually started working on this one instead because I was getting so flustered working with the values and reworking the body shape and the, the scales. And I feel like it's one of those gut feelings you have when you know you're over-rendering it. And I, I knew I was over-rendering it. So I like I had to do a different piece to get my mind out of it. Uh, now going back to this piece, I can kind of see where I can fix it. But it took me a little bit to figure out how to tap into that gut feeling of when you know you're over-rendering something. I think a lot of the times you can tell if you're over-rendering if you're adding to a piece, uh, like you're adding value or you're adding lines or you're adding sharpness, but it doesn't add any value to the overall presentation. You know what I mean? I think that's been very difficult for me because I tend to render everything in a piece. So for me, uh, I need to get better at allowing some of the freedom. And I think that's why the floral goddess drawing I showed earlier, I think that's why it has some of that feeling because I let some things be more loose and unrendered and I think it actually added to uh, the push and pull of where the focus was in the piece. So yeah, that's a that's a tough question for me to say like definitively, this is when I over render, but I, I do think it's that gut feeling. And then knowing when it's finished, if there's a certain way that you like to render things, like even on this piece, I remember working on even the leaves and I couldn't not render every leaf and like give it an edge so if i didn't do that to me it wouldn't be finished and i think once again this is another one of those gut feelings where you know when your piece is finished or not uh and you also probably know when you are skimping on something so i always try to uh remind myself of there was something i was told in grade school and that's when you sign something you are saying this is the best uh to my ability that I can do something. It was like my third grade teacher told me that when I, I did uh, an assignment or like homework or something. And that stuck with me so vividly because we always had to sign our paper um, at the end. And um, it was that reminder of when you sign it, you're basically saying, this is the best that you can do. And I think about that when I do art because I usually sign my pieces at the very end, uh, as you can see, huh? And basically when I'm doing that signature, it's like, this is the best to my ability that I was able to uh, create this piece. So if you feel happy and comfortable with signing that piece once you're finished, then you know it's finished. But if you sign it with like a, a ping of regret or feeling like you were lazy and you could have done more, but you just want to get it done, then I don't think it's finished. So yeah. Uh, by the way, thanks for the previous answer. That will save me a lot of time. Yeah, I, I hope so. Uh, Age of the Atom Head says, How have conventions been in the COVID era? I haven't been able to bring myself to get out there since the pandemic kicked off. Uh, it's been interesting. Um, we started doing cons again late last year. It was in August. And it has been very contrasting depending on where in the states specifically you go. Like we went to um, Indiana Comic Con and uh, they didn't even have masks. Uh, <laughs> it was basically everyone was, it felt like a, a real normal con again. But then the next week we went to Dragon Con where everyone had to have a mask and you had to have a proof of X or a proof of negative. And it was like a, a it was the best con I've ever had, surprisingly. It broke my New York record, which I thought was unbeatable for that time. Uh, so that was really surprising. But then we went to Emerald City and C2E2, which is in Seattle and Chicago, both very um, cautious of COVID states and uh, very capped attendance. And they were definitely underperforming like by a lot. I think a lot of artists said they were doing much worse than they normally would at these cons. Uh, and it, it's kind of a hit or miss situation. You don't know what you're going to get with cons right now, and especially with different areas of the country kind of dealing with COVID differently. Uh, me and Josh are basically just following what guidelines they have in store and then running with that. 
And I think for me, I'm just, I'm excited for cons to be back fully. Uh, I'm hoping that it, you know, something crazy doesn't happen with COVID again. Uh, we'll see. But I know for the most part at Gen Con and Dragon Con, people were hitting their records, which was crazy. But I think it's because people were locked up for so long that when a convention opened up in their area, they just like went crazy and like probably even overbought. Uh, but then that wasn't true for C2E2 and Emerald. So I don't know. It's been a big hit or miss, I would say, for cons. Niangolo says, what are you doing? What you are doing right now is very difficult. Answering questions which have nothing to do with each other, like jumping from one branch to another and focusing on the piece in front of you. Uh, I, You know, I've been doing streaming for so long. I think I, I kind of just got the hang of talking while uh, working on something. Uh, sometimes, yeah, when I'm like drawing with pencil stuff, it's a little harder to do live stream and answer questions like this. But that's why I bring uh, Josh in and he usually is like the moderator and that helps so that I can like stay focused on the drawing while talking rather than having to look up um, often while the stream is running. So yeah, it's kind of like one of those learned skills you get just from streaming out for a while. Uh, Carlos says, how do you stream from two cameras? So the camera here is the one that's built into my Mac. And then this camera, if you can, you see it here, this one is a iPhone that's hooked up to the computer and it's running through OBS and that's how I do it. And that's how I, I do my drawing ones as well. So yeah, it's pretty easy. I definitely recommend it if you're interested in streaming. Okay, that one, oh, I got to sign it. Slow Burn Studio says, I make a full-time living doing pattern design, but my true love is figurative art. I want to transition within the next few years. Do you think Instagram or YouTube is the best place to build? Okay, I mean, my first answer or my first reaction instinct would be to say both, for sure. But I think it's good to, oops, I didn't even do the rope on his actual foot. Uh, I think understanding what intention are you trying to get out of YouTube and what are you trying to get out of Instagram? I was just watching this video about this girl explaining how her she was jumping from niche to niche and she was trying to figure out like where she fit in and uh, she realized that Instagram wasn't as big of a focused or a goal hitter for her as YouTube was. So I think it's good to understand like what are you trying to utilize each platform for? Because if you can use both, then that's great. But like for me, uh, I have to be very aware of my time management and the number one thing I want to do is draw. So is it going to be Instagram? Is it going to be YouTube? Is it going to be TikTok? Is it going to be DeviantArt? Is it going to be Facebook? Is it going to be Twitter? Like what platform is going to give me the best opportunity to make money while still being able to do what I love? Uh, and I'm learning that YouTube, you can definitely get some good residual income every month and it's been like consistent. Uh, and I, I barely focus on YouTube, but I usually make between 200, 200 and 300 a month on YouTube, which doesn't seem like a lot, but I don't put a lot of effort into YouTube. So I think a lot of the time it's, you kind of get what you put in, but you also have to be very aware of uh, the research behind what you're putting in. Like if I really wanted to make more money on YouTube, I would probably do way more live streaming and I would probably focus way more on creating pre-recorded content that would be pushing out at least once a week there should be a new video and you do see some artists doing this like draw with jaza or the ross tran channel or um proco or cynics uh there's a lot of these artists that you know they really make youtube their their focus and you you can just tell uh you want to be careful not to spread yourself out too thin be behind a bunch of different platforms because then you won't really succeed in any of them and i know <laughs> People hate when I say this quote, the master of none but a jack of all trades. But I know that then it's like, uh, um, what is it? The jack of all trades is a master of none, but it's still better than being a master of one or something like that. But honestly, in the art world, and especially trying to make money financially, the best advice I was given was by a Lyft driver at a convention. He was like a retired millionaire and he just needed something to do. So he started doing Lyft. Uh, on like on the side so 
he told me that you should have five outlets of income. The reason is because four should be like a table. They, you know, they're your foundation, they're sturdy. But the reason why you need five is because if one of the four breaks, your table will fall over. So he says you need five because four is your foundation, five is your security measure. And he said, you can think of it like your hand with the thumb being your biggest income source. That's why the biggest. So he made me evaluate in the car. It was really cool. I, I'm so glad he, he taught me this because I feel like it was very valuable for me then as it is now. So the way that I look at it is conventions would be my thumb. Etsy would be my number two. Three would be Patreon. Four would be YouTube. And then five would be the commissions and freelance that I sometimes do. Uh, and I try to put all of my uh, effort into the thumb and try not to forget the remaining four. So I guess for you, figure out what your thumb would be and then <laughs> make sure you put most of your eggs in that basket. But if it's really not working after like six months or a year, maybe you should try one of your other outlets of revenue and maybe maybe YouTube wasn't your calling and maybe it was Twitter, you know, like who knows? And, or maybe it was like really focusing on Etsy and Etsy or maybe Gumroad. You know, there, there's just so many ways to make money as artists nowadays, it's crazy. I have art friends that make their, their living just from Patreon and they're not even like selling prints or anything. They just have enough people every month that wanna see behind the scenes stuff and they don't even ship anything out, but that's their primary source of income, which is crazy. Uh, and throughout this pandemic, I was able to go, I think my Patreon went from like 600 a month to at one point it was like high-fiving 2000, which was crazy because that pays basically most of my bills every month. Um, and I think it was because I was putting way more effort into Patreon because I didn't have conventions anymore. My uh, thumb essentially was cut off and I needed to rely on the other four revenues of income. And thankfully I was lucky enough where I was able to pivot when COVID hit and I was really able to rely on my online sources of income. But it, it was very difficult and I feel, I feel very bad for a lot of my friends. They were not able to pivot uh, quite so easily. Uh, so I think that's something to make sure you're also aware of is Yes, you should definitely have one be like your main focus, but definitely don't let it be your only focus. All right, sorry, long. Sometimes I rant when answering questions because I feel like I need to give the full spectrum uh, story of what I'm trying to say. Let's see here. Janisa, Janisha Color says, speaking of cards, what company do you go through to print your playing slash tarot cards? I'm working on a set of Oracle cards and I'm not sure where to print them. Uh, we are actually partnering with Bicycle. So the the last deck I made was actually through WeMakePlayingCards.com, and they were okay. I had a lot of people tell me, though, apparently the card community, the people that you know play with playing cards specifically, I don't know about Oracle decks as much, but I know for playing cards, they're very peculiar or very specific about what type of card stock and where you get it printed from. So that's why we're partnering with Bicycle because I realized, yeah, people are very specific about that. So I mean, I would reach out to Bicycle, but I don't know if they do um, Oracle cards. I'm sure they could, but I would just ask. Oh, let's see here. A New Beginning says, your mega book idea is really cool. What are the fundamentals of an art book? Is it like a compilation of the best art of an artist year? And how is it more effective compared to prints? You know what? Let me grab mine. They're right around the corner here. Oof. All right, so these are my four art books. Let me just scoot up a bit. So when I started my journey, this was my first art book. And, um, this was not hardcover before. Uh, originally, they were soft cover, but when I got them reprinted, I decided to make them hardcover to match the format of the other ones. But what was great about this book is I was just kind of testing the waters and seeing like, are people interested in a pencil art book? And they they were. And it was, you know, at the time when I did the Kickstarter, I made like $3,100 and I thought, 
I literally thought I was rich. <laughs> um, I didn't really take into perspective the cost of the books and shipping and everything. So my net profit was definitely lower, but uh, it's basically just a collection of your work. And for me, I try to do it every two years because at the time I knew I was a slower artist when it came to pencil stuff, but uh, I had a full-time job as well. So I didn't want my books to be like super thin. But what was funny is because this book did well, when I went on to my second book, ta-da, it's much thicker. And this one, I really poured my heart and soul into making it. I was drawing like crazy. And I really saw potential in like my book making um, ability to be my main source of income. So this book was my kind of leap into being more of a serious artist. And to be honest, I think a lot of people this is when they started kind of following me on Instagram. My my Instagram number went from like, oh my gosh, it went from like 3,000 to 5,000 to about 70,000. I mean, it was a, it was a big jump uh, doing all these drawings and really like setting my mind on it. And then when it came to make my third book, this is when I left my job. So you can see kind of the same size, but the difference in this one was I really focused on kind of edge to edge drawings, which was new for me. So a lot of them were much bigger. Uh, and a lot of them I just put more time into the actual uh, piece, where the, the previous one, it was just trying to create quantity, where this one I was trying to make a little more quality. And also I wanted to do more of like storybook pages, which uh, has always been a dream of mine to do like a short storybook. And oh, and this was the fox that I was talking about earlier. This was the one where I was trying to like play the game. Uh, so this one was pretty fun and then I believe this is the one where at the end yeah so then at the end of this one I showed a preview of my book Swordplay which is my illustrated novel that I'm gonna tackle after I do the tarot deck but I really love the idea of doing a book like this where it's like illustrations alongside words so this was like my first attempt in seeing like what that would be like so that was really fun and then lastly my newest book uh, it's ginormous because this was the first year of, or the second year, or no, this is 2019-2020. So yeah, this is through COVID. So because I didn't have conventions, I was able to draw way more. And I was able to really dig my heels into the drawing side of things and like go for much bigger drawings, drawings that uh, just I, I really enjoyed doing. And here's the Dirt Kids we were talking about earlier. So yes, I think it's good to do simple things alongside complicated things, you know, have fun with it. This is when I made my first card deck, so I wanted to show all the cards in the deck. Uh, and this is when I took on 11 commissions because I panicked a little bit and I took on a bunch. That's why you see, or was it the cloud riding the chocobo? Uh, so that was, that was interesting. And I even talked about my response to Corona and how strange it was for uh, artists. Oh, and then here's the other chapter of Swordplay that I, I created so far. So once again, another like story alongside uh, illustrations. And that's something I, re I really wanna do someday. So after the tarot deck, expect a giant storybook like that. I'm very, very excited for that. So yeah, so m books making over the years, or book making over the years has been uh, this weird passion of mine that's only gotten stronger and stronger and it has really really paid off for me in the long run and I encourage any of you that have an interest in like making your own art book to just do it because looking at my first art book now cringe uh, it's borderline embarrassing for me to look at the book now or like when people buy it at a con I'm like are you sure that's the one you want uh, and it's okay, you know, we all start somewhere. And kind of like we were saying too earlier, it's like people like seeing the process. So don't be afraid to show them where you're at now because it'll look that much cooler than when they see where you're at in the future. Oh, and sorry, the second part of your question is, or what are the fundamentals of an art book? Basically just to show off your art. I like to have minimal words and have it be more of like a true art book. And then how is it effective compared to prints? I would say they're like 50-50. Uh, prints usually 
pour more in for uh, cons, depending on what con you go to. Some areas like books more, some like prints more. You know, you never know where you're going to uh, get. Like when I went to uh, overseas in Europe for a convention, they hated big prints. They hated large prints. They don't have the space for it, but they loved books. Uh, I did not know that. So uh, I came home with like a bunch of prints but my book sold out on like day one or day two so you never know where uh, your sales are going to be higher or lower but the way that I look at it oops let me move back down here the way that I look at it though is if you have a variety of products that you're selling you're bound to make your profit uh, within one of them or like spread between all of your products so for me I have my prints, my art books, my card decks, my tote bags, my metal pins, and my journals. And I feel like there's something else. Oh, and then my originals. So between all of those, I usually have a spread of sales. And you, you want to have enough of variety for people um, and enough of a spread that you could appeal to anyone that pa passes by your booth. Oof. Let's see here. Uh, Janisha, or wait, sorry. Niango says, I guess you've answered it before, but I don't know the answer. So why did you put aside making digital art and choose paper and pencil? Uh, you know, it's one of those things where it's weird because I, I taught how to paint digital art for like seven years. So there's still a part of me that loves digital painting. Um, and I do think I will get back into it, uh, especially when I do my sword play book. I love the idea of my chapter breaks in the stories to be color and then the actual pages within to be black and white and pencil. But I think the reason I, I changed from color to pencil is because um, I have more of a, a love for pencil. I, I think because that's the only thing I really grew up with. Uh, I didn't work with paint really growing up. I didn't work with, there, there wasn't even really digital art, wasn't really a thing when I was growing up. And I, all I remember is, you know, stealing computer paper from my dad's printer in his office and just drawing with pencil. And I think that's just stuck with me. The love for that has stuck with me so much over the years that uh, when I was able to make the leap to go full pencil, I did. But I have been yearning to do some color stuff again. Uh, if, if some of you have been following me for a while, you probably know my swordplay illustrations are very, very colorful, very edge to edge, and I miss doing some of that. So don't be surprised to see color stuff for me again in the future. Um, Janisha says, I miss conventions, but I'm scared of germs. Uh, I think right now, if if you're like more COVID conscious, then yeah, I don't think now would be the time to go to conventions. But uh it's, it really comes down to what you're comfortable with. So who knows? I, I keep being told that 2023 is going to be the year when we're really going to be more kind of over everything. Uh, I know for myself, I was definitely ready to go back to cons last year. So uh, that, it, it all depends on where you're comfortable with, you know. Let's see here. Slow Burn Studio says five outlets. Amazing advice. This is excellent. Thank you for the advice. Absolutely. It's what, like I said, I want someone that Uber driver, that Lyft driver passed that knowledge baton to me. And I hope I can then pass it to other people because I really liked it. And I still use that five method uh, technique for myself and my business today. And that was like five or six years ago. He, he told me that. All right, let's move on to the next card here. Ooh, we got the high priest. Do I only have one of these? All right. Well, I guess I got the high priestess and then the queen of wands, and then we'll finish the stream off. Um, Let's see here. That's some super wisdom. <laughs> Whoever that Lyft driver was, I wish I got his name, but he was definitely super wisdom. Uh, Oscar says, I really hope the thumb works out. It would look super weird if your pinky's thicker, thicker than the thumb. <laughs> uh, yeah yeah i would agree and for me it would it would be really bothersome uh if because for me freelance stuff and commissions are my pinky and if my pinky was my main source of income i wouldn't be happy and it would feel weird so yeah my pinky being the biggest would feel weird because i don't want commissions to be my main source of income 
Uh, so make sure you also are trying to be self-aware of what do you actually enjoy doing, you know? And for me, I genuinely enjoy doing cons. So I, I want that to be my thumb. But as I get older, like maybe that will be more Etsy and online sales because that has uh, kind of paid off for me through COVID. And because I put more time and energy into it, I saw more of a payout. And I realized that, yeah, maybe it would be nice if Josh and I could just, you know, stay in more of the summer rather than be gone every single weekend um, or every other weekend in the spring and summer. And then fall will just always be busy. If you are an American convention artist, I would say doing having to do Dragon Con, Gen Con, New York Comic Con, like the three really big ones, they're all within like a eight week period. So it's almost like every other weekend. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. Elena says, I still don't own the third sketchbook. I hope to get it one day. I mean, you could just wait until the mega book. You got two more years for that. Uh, Niango says, that book from 2013 just reminded me that you've been God for more than a decade. I All hopes are gone. I, I'm telling you that it, that book is not great. I, <laughs> all right, if we're talking about like being able to be critical on oneself, let's see here. Where's, I mean, one, this is cringy. Uh, me being like with the crown and very Kingdom Hearts, but I'm not a fan of that anymore. I, I love Kingdom Hearts still. I don't like my me crowning myself. Um, where's one that I really like? This is not great in my opinion. I actually still love this drawing. This is one I, I won't be super harsh on because this was my first pencil drawing that kind of pushed me back into this direction. So I think I'll always have kind of this emotional connection to this drawing. But my other drawings I can rip apart. On this one, her eye is way too big. Uh, it wouldn't fit her face. If you can imagine that same big eye on that side, it would look very alien-esque. And something that I really liked doing back then is like really being so loose that the form just evaporated into nothing. And there's things that I like about it, but it was me trying to hide the fact that I don't think I could have confidently rendered this. So it was like me trying to get away with uh, things. Like you, you see it a lot in my early work where I just, I don't think I knew exactly how to render it. Or maybe I was like so confident that I was like, you know what, I only need to render the head and then the rest of it, they can fill in the blanks with their imagination. But you can see like, look at this, I didn't even draw this eye probably because I didn't feel comfortable enough drawing it. It probably looks so off. Yeah, that one's whatever. I mean, this is very much like, I'm, I'm learning how to do heavier outlines versus thinner outlines. Once again, the very like, I'm, I'm just gonna draw the head and the rest of it you can fill in the blanks. And like, it's not a very long book. So for two years, this being all the drawings I did, uh, not that many. The one thing I did like about this book though that I, I didn't do on the other ones is I used to read Animorphs growing up as a kid. And I love the fact that they had this like little corner uh, trick. So if you look, you can see my face slowly growing into the drawing with every turn of the page until here. And then that's the finished illustration. So I had to like scan this drawing every stage of the book. So I had to count how many pages there would be. And then I did it so that when you slowly turn the pages, it would like grow into the finished drawing. All right, let me get it on camera. <laughs> I thought I was so clever back then. <laughs> um, but it would have been cooler if it was like an actual cool image, but it was just my face. Something I do want to do for my mega book, though, um, if you guys have ever seen it, I forgot what it's called at the top of my head, but it's where you take the book, and if you bend the pages like this, there will be like a secret image that appears on the, the or this isn't called the spine, what would this be called? Just the page ends? Yeah, there's like a secret image that forms right here when you bend the book a certain way. So one of those little Easter eggs that if any of you guys get my mega book, I'm gonna try to make that happen. I'm gonna figure out how to do it, and I'm gonna, actually, not even I want to, I'm going to make that happen. Uh, 
Oh, uh, let's see here. Bookbinding is so fun. Um, I, uh, I I haven't bookbinded myself, but I hear it's great. Um, a new beginning says, "Oh my God, the sketchbooks are amazing! Thank you so much for the insight." I, if you are an artist that has a lot of quantity in your work, you should consider making an art book. It really has helped me, you know, push along my career further than it would have without it, for sure. Uh, hey, Alvin, how's it going? Jen says, weather is colder in Europe than the U.S. generally, so rooms are smaller and easier to heat, which doesn't leave room for a lot of prints, I'm guessing. I think so, too. And I think they were built a lot earlier. Where a lot of American homes, they tend to be like built in the 70s or 80s. And nowadays, it's like still brand new homes are being built. And they're just, they're big. Uh, America, Americans like their space, apparently. And they like these large, massive prints. So... I mean, I, I kind of respect the European side of things, though, where, you know, it's more condensed and it feels like more purposeful, like it has more character to each room, where in America, there's like, oh, just make it like 100 feet wide and we'll just fill it in with things. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Felix says, I think your style of solid color and gradients would mesh super well with watercolor. You know, I, I used to do a, a lot of watercolor stuff in high school. But I would always like use colored pencil over it. And it was more like abstract splashing kind of thing, which I thought was kind of cool at the time. And then I went to college and realized everyone goes through a period where they're doing like splashy watercolor things. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I, I thought I was on my personal journey, but apparently that's everyone's journey. So who knows? Maybe I would get back into doing uh, more watercolor stuff again. Uh, let's see here. Elena says, and here comes the second of my three favorite works of yours, The High Priestess, which is so funny. This one, I have such a weird feeling about The High Priestess because I had such difficulty working on this. And to be honest, I struggled with her a lot. I redid this backdrop uh, so many times. And even with her, even doing like the little intricacies on her chest area, it was just frustrating. Uh, I'm glad that you like it because I know for me personally, it was a journey, we'll say. <laughs> uh, I think this took me like 60 hours and it should have only taken like 30, maybe 35, 40. Um, but there was 20 hours where it was just erasing, redoing, um, editing, starting over. It was not great. So looking at the piece, it brings up a lot of weird emotions for me of... Uh, like complications and stress and it's funny because the high priestess a lot of the the meaning of the card is like um how do i how do i say this it's like trusting your gut feeling your intuition and she's supposed to be reading from this book that like has the knowledge and answers to your questions but only she can see it so it's the idea of like trusting that intuition and I think be while working on it, I was not trusting my intuition, and that's why I struggled with it so much. And the whole time, I have this lady staring at me that's basically saying, trust your intuition. And the whole time, I'm just, like, fighting it. Uh, so uh, this one has, like, a weird association for me. But I'm weirdly, it was received pretty well online, but I was not expecting that. I thought people were not going to like this because it was too over-rendered in areas. It was... Um, a bit hard to read where she ends and where the backdrop begins. Uh, yeah, this was this was an interesting one for me for sure. But I'm I'm glad you like it though. It kind of it helps me reassess the piece then of like maybe I'm being too harsh on myself at times. Um, but I think I have that problem, which I'm sure a lot of you have as well, of wanting things to look a certain way, and if it doesn't hit that level of quality, uh, then you just see it as like a failure in a way which is frustrating <laughs> let's see here uh to toborn toborn the great says it does put the plate spinning aspect into perspective uh i'm not sure i follow i might be so far behind that maybe that was talking about something else uh elena says true yeah i will most likely get a mega book too uh, that's the one i'm really excited to make i think that's going to be the the most proud thing I've ever done. I would hope. 
Well, I would hope for no, but you would always want like the project after to be the one you are most excited about. You always want to like keep that momentum going in whatever you're you're doing. So for the Queen of Wands, this one, which I actually I like this one a lot. Uh, I don't say that a lot about my my drawings, but it was just a really fun piece to work on um, from start to finish. I did have to start her over at one point. Her hand was too close to her body, so I actually started the whole drawing over because I couldn't erase it correctly. Uh, but like having my own cat Casper sit and like take a reference photo for the black cat and then drawing this very symmetrical throne and then really interpreting the backdrop of this top half was uh, exciting for me. It was like I was trusting that intuition, kind of like what I should have done with the High Priestess, but I, I pulled it with this one and like really just tried to let the drawing speak to me and what was working and what needed to be changed. Uh, let's see, where were we? Alvin says, oh, I remember those drawings since you streamed them a lot, mostly the Bunny Gang in 2014. Yeah. It's crazy that it was that long ago. Uh, time has been flying for me. I mean, I can't believe it's 2022. I mean, some days I can't believe I'm 32 years of age, you know? Like, I always thought 30 was, like, older. <laughs> like, the threshold of when you're considered older is when you hit 30. But honestly, being 30s are amazing. I don't know if any of you are watching in your 30s, but I really like being in my 30s. There's a lot of there's a lot less chaos. Um, I feel like usually your friend group has kind of matured in a way where you're just comfortable around them. There's not a lot of petty drama as much because people just stop caring about petty drama. And I feel like I can focus more on like my friends and family and my passion, you know, and that's all I really care about in in life. There we go. Nice little ring on top. Uh, Slow Burn says, yeah, you've grown exponentially since this book. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I look at the 2013-2014 book and I'm always, like I cringe to put it on my, my table at Boots. <laughs> um, Toburn says, please say you flip booked the bigger sketchbooks. I didn't. I, I'm thinking I might do it with my mega book. Uh, but for the first book, there was only 40 pages, so I knew I had 20 drawings I had to do to fit each page to flip it. But like my newest book was 190 pages, so that would be like 95 times I'd have to scan a drawing from start to finish. Um, who knows? Maybe I'll do that with my mega book if I'm feeling like super inspired to want to do that again. Because I do think it, I, I still think it's kind of cool. I just wish I would have done a cooler subject matter. I think doing just my face with a crown is kind of wah wah. I think I could have done something cooler. And if I did it again, I would do something cooler. Um, Oscar says, one last thing, draw more landscapes. Uh, possibly. Landscapes are definitely not my favorite thing. But I think if I'm going to be doing this graphic novel, I feel like I have to because I can't just do close-ups of characters all the time. So at some point, I'm going to have to navigate drawing more landscapes. So it's something that I'm going to have to battle. But, you know, art should be a little bit of a challenge. Otherwise, we would just be producers, not artists. Uh, Light says, oh, used to do it in thick grammar books, sketches on the edges. Yeah, I want to do that so bad. Alvin says, how did you make those books and how to sell those? Any tips? Thanks. I want to try even in a few pages. I, I would say if you're really actually serious about making a book, I mean, I go through uh, a place called uh, Print Lore, but I have worked with many other book companies over the years, and I keep trying to find the best one. But Print Lore was by someone I actually knew back in the day, and she was a friend that uh, started her own uh, book publishing company. So that's why I go through her, but there are, there are hundreds of book publishers, um, not even in America, I'm sure around the world. So basically I would reach out to one of them, 
kind of ask what their or you have to tell them like what size you want the book and if it's possible you know have that back and forth conversation and then how many pages you're thinking and uh, what type of an art book it will be and once you kind of get those things all set then they will send you a file format of like how much bleed and how much crop you need on each page so for me i think it's like a quarter of an inch on all sides and you got to do that for each page some people use InDesign to set up their book. I personally just use Photoshop. I have two separate files. I have uh, left side and right side, and I have those files right next to each other. So as I turn the page, I have both of those pages next to each other. Uh, and literally from there, it's just a lot of time and effort placing the images, putting them where you want. Uh, I try to put them in the book to kind of narrate a story uh, throughout the year. And then I often write little snippets to myself. So throughout the art book, I'll include these little quotes that I write to myself. And they're like nice little breaks from it just being like visual narrative to break it up with like a slight um, short, you know, few sentences about what was going on. Oh, it's my last print. All right, this is it. So that's how I would get started if you want to make a book. Uh, Slow Burn says, R-O-F-L, I did drippy watercolor things for the longest. Yeah, I, I realized every artist does it. I, I thought I was being more unique. No, it's everyone's journey. Um, Light Lollet says, I might try making a zine. It's a bit simpler than a book, but might be good for like testing the waters or something. Yeah, if you feel more comfortable doing a zine first, do it. I personally would recommend if you, you can budget it, making a book, but if that is just not feasible right now then yeah I would say make a zine first and then test the waters and even if it doesn't work don't give up because maybe you just needed more quantity maybe you needed more quality uh, I think it's a good way to see are people interested is this something that could be like a market for me to get into and I personally love art books and I know a lot of my friends also love art books so know that there is a market for it Um, Jen says people are not necessarily turned off by vagueness in art like unanswered questions is not always a negative I agree I think the way that I see my art I see like my negative um, or the vagueness in a lot of the the clothing as a lack of self-confidence so for me because I know I'm a, like a detail heavy artist I look at those and I can just see this lack of confidence or maybe it was like arrogance that I could get away with it but I agree, it's it's not necessarily a bad thing. And maybe I worded it wrong because I, I do think vagueness can be really cool, especially with, uh, there's an artist, I think their name is Black Gold Sun. I just bought their art book actually, but it's very like splashing of colors and then like a figure kind of pulling through. Or like Vanessa Lemon does it as well. So yes, I do think vagueness can be super great as well. I think for myself as an artist, I see it as like a, a way to hide my flaws which I don't like. I like to like really push myself um, to be the best artist I can be. And if there's something that's uncomfortable, I try to tackle it, you know. Uh, El oh, Alvin, you're also gonna be 32. Yep, I feel it. Uh, oh, a lot of you are 30. Okay, this is great. We're, we're right there with each other. Um, Alvin says, I still can't, I think you mean can't sell. Oh yeah, still can't sell art, but I'm 31 going on 32. That's okay. I, I know artists that started in their 30s and now they're financially independent. So when you start really doesn't matter. I mean, it definitely is easier to gain momentum when you're younger. And I think the older we get, oftentimes we have more distractions in our life, whether it's you know a partner, a family, um, financial problems that we got to take care of because we're older. Uh, so that's where I think the difficulty comes from. But Honestly, if you are uh, really determined and you're passionate about like making or uh, making art your career, it's very much not only possible but feasible. I think you just have to to really go hard, um, especially if you're starting in your 30s. But it's definitely possible. Um, Felix says, if you don't cringe at your past self, you're not growing. Uh, yeah, I I definitely cringe at. 
Actually, I should show you guys my high school art sometime one of these streams. There's a lot of cringe there. <laughs> but you're right. I mean, we all start somewhere. And uh, you, if you aren't growing, like if I was doing the same quality I was doing in high school, like what does that say about me as a person and as an artist? Um, I, I don't think I would be happy with myself. Okay. And with that, that is the final print. So I am done. Where Oh, gosh. Where did I put the cap? <laughs> oh there it is all right so thank you guys so much for coming to this live stream wow this is right on the mark two hours but uh thank you so much for coming i'm hoping to do a live stream i i will be doing a live stream next week it'll be after the chaos is gone with these 15 artists coming to stay with us for amkey weekend and uh i'm pretty sure i'll be working on a mermaid next wednesday so if you want to come uh, next week and watch me draw a mermaid and have another conversation i would love to have that with you guys so thank you as always and i hope you guys have a great rest of your day and until next week take care all right take care everyone bye 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 bye